Hi, and welcome to this lecture about periimplantitis reconstructive surgery. My name is Denise Abadji, and I work as a periodontist in Stockholm, Sweden. Before we start, I would like to remind you about the diagnostics when it comes to periimplantitis. Periimplantitis is an irreversible condition. It's an inflammatory disease with a progressive bone loss. There are several ways to treat periimplantitis, but all of them are surgical. Non-surgical therapy usually have a very small effect when it comes to periimplantitis. I have listed four types of surgical treatment that you can consider. The first one is a surgical cleaning. With this, I mean that you do a flap, you do a cleaning around the implant, you remove calculus and granulation tissue, and then you place your flap back. According to the literature, there is a chance that you might have bone fill after this type of treatment, even though you haven't placed any biomaterial in the crater defect. The second option is doing a resective therapy. With this, I mean that you try to make the crater defect more horizontal that is around the implant and in such way try to treat the periimplantitis. The disadvantages with this type of treatment is that you will get a gingival recession that will affect the aesthetic appearance and it might affect the patient's speech. The third treatment option is reconstructive surgery. When you do reconstructive surgery, you use different types of biomaterials or autogenous bone in combination with membranes to try to augment the area and have bone fill in the crater defect that's surrounding the implant. The last treatment option is explantation. Explantation is done when the peri-implant situation is untreatable because of a severe bone loss. But explantation can also be done when the affected implant that is removed won't affect the prosthetic construction. Now we're going to discuss periimplantitis reconstructive surgery. First, I would like to talk about the advantages and the disadvantages with this treatment. The advantages are following. If you will succeed with your reconstructive surgery, there will be less gingival recession around the implant. This will give a better aesthetic outcome. If the reconstruction and augmentation is successful, hopefully this will improve the long-term prognosis of the implant. The disadvantages are following. Unfortunately, this treatment is quite unpredictable. We don't know and we can't predict the result right after the surgery or over time. There is a lack of scientific evidence with longer follow-ups and we need more of that so that we can give the patient more information about the predictability with this treatment and the result over time. There will be an additional cost for the patient when you do this type of surgery since you need to use different types of biomaterials and membranes. The surgeon performing the surgery should have some surgical skills because the biomaterial and the membranes might be quite difficult to handle and to place in the crater defect. Checklist before reconstructive periimplantitis surgery. It's really important that the patient that you are performing this treatment on has a really good daily oral hygiene procedure. Otherwise, you won't be successful with your treatment. The patient shouldn't be a smoker either, since that is a risk factor. If the patient is on any anticoagulant medicine, you should talk to their doctor before performing the surgery. A heavy bleeding will make it more difficult to actually see what you're doing, and it will be more difficult to place the material in place, but also to place the membrane over it, 
in worst case, the material will be moving and that will also affect the result. I would not perform this type of surgery on patients that have undergone earlier radiation therapy, intravenous bisphosphonate treatment, and poorly controlled diabetes. It's important that you talk to your patient before performing the surgery so that they have realistic expectations on the result and that they are aware of the additional costs. Checklist after reconstructive surgery. I will always prescribe antibiotics after reconstructive surgery to lower the risk for post-operative infection. The patient is not allowed to brush on the affected site during the first six weeks after surgery. Instead, I recommend the patient to rinse with chlorhexidine twice a day during the first six weeks. Usually, I remove the sutures two weeks after surgery. Our first healing control is performed six weeks after surgery. During this visit, I will instruct the patient in proper oral hygiene procedures so we'll be successful with our treatment. I will also remove the chlorhexidine stains on the remaining teeth after this surgery. The second and the third healing controls are performed 12 weeks and five months after surgery. These visits are mostly to see that the patient is really taking care of the area, that it's clean and it looks neat, and that there isn't a post-operative infection going on, just to make sure that everything is under control. Our first evaluation is made six months after surgery. During this visit, I will probe around the area to see if there is any bleeding on probing or pus, and if we have a decreased probing pocket depth. I will also take an x-ray during this visit to see if we are successful with our bone augmentation and reconstruction. If we are successful with our treatment, the patient will continue with supportive treatment every three to four months visiting the dental hygienist and I will do yearly checkups to make sure that our treatment is successful over time. This is the first case I'm going to show you. This was a 86 year old patient who had undergone implant treatment 15 years earlier. He got two implants and when I met him the first time, one of the implants was suffering of periimplantitis. The patient was, he was really sad. He was 86 years old. He didn't want a complicated treatment. He just wanted to keep his bridge. So we decided to try to do reconstructive surgery around the affected implant. What I usually do is that I do, I perform a flap. I remove the granulation tissue and calculus with hand instruments. Then I use a piezo ultrasonic device with a special tip to clean and disinfect the implant. This tip is made especially for implants, so you won't scratch the implant surface, just clean it. When that is done, I use 3% hydrogen peroxide to disinfect the area and the implant and rinse the area with sodium chloride. When that is done, I use the biomaterial. Usually I use uh, bio-os small particles and I place it in the creator defect. You can also use bio-os collagen if you prefer to. When the biomaterial is placed, uh, if you have a screw retained construction, it's the easiest way to place your membrane is to do, you punch the membrane and then you place the membrane over the implant and it's fixated there. This is more difficult to do if the implant and the prosthetic construction is cemented. Then you need to do your punched membrane, you need to do a cut in it, and you need to try to place it around the implant. After this, it's really important that you have a tension-free flap when you put your flap back and put sutures 
place your sutures carefully because that will affect the healing and our final result. Here is the result six months after surgery. As you can see on the x-ray, we have bone fill after surgery, and my clinical examination showed no bleeding on probing, no pus, and a decreased probing pocket depth. So six months after surgery, we are successful with our treatment. The patient was really happy about the result, and I was very happy too, but the patient needs to continue with supportive treatment every three to four months, and I need to do yearly checkups to see that the result is maintained over time. This was a woman in her 50s with a 10-year-old implant. She had undergone treatment for generalized periodontitis. When I met her a year after the treatment for the generalized periodontitis, I discovered periimplantitis around the implant 2.6. She was desperate to get an implant in position 2.5. And usually I'm quite conservative when it comes to treatment, but in this case, I decided to place an implant in position 2.5 and at the same time perform reconstructive periimplantitis surgery around 2.6. So what I did was that I placed the implant in position 2.5, then I placed my biomaterial, the bios, and the created effect around 2.6. When that was done, I placed a collagen membrane over both implants, and then I had some submerged healing for six months. The result showed uh, improved clinical and radiological status, and this status, it continued one and a half years after surgery. The patient got a prosthetic bridge on the two implants, and she will continue with supportive treatment and yearly checkups. This is a woman who was in her 40s uh, when I met her the first time. She had undergone implant treatment 20 years earlier because she was missing the permanent tooth in position 2-2. The patient was worried that she would lose her implant and she was worried about how the surgery would affect her aesthetic appearance. I decided to perform a reconstructive periimplantitis surgery here. The results showed an improved clinical status and an improved radiological status up to two years after surgery. Some of the biomaterial is, looks integrated, uh, but I suspect that some of the material is not integrated when I look on the x-ray two years after surgery. And this is the problem with this type of treatment. We don't really know how the material will behave over time, and we need more studies to show this. Uh, but at least here, uh, the clinical parameters are improved, the radiological status improved, and the aesthetic appearance was good. With that said, thank you so much for your kind attention. If you like this lecture and would like to learn more, uh, you're more than welcome to follow me on Instagram. My name on Instagram is uh, Abaji Specialist Dentistry. And I post all types of interesting, exciting um, posts and cases uh, affecting periodontitis, periimplantitis, implantology, and augmentation. So you're more than welcome to follow me there. If you have any questions, uh, you're more than welcome to email me and I will do my best to respond to you as soon as possible. Thank you so much. My name is Denise Abadji. Take care and bye.